I am very happy to announce to all of you that from 6.30 to 7.30 this evening His Holiness Srila Jai Patak Swami Maharaj will be speaking to us. So just to keep you here until then, I have been assigned to say something. Yesterday, we were discussing after Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu returned from Gaya. He met with all the devotees of Navadweep. At that time, he was most eager to render every type of service. Because you see, bhakti is the science of reconnecting with Krishna, with the source of all that exists, with the all-attractive, all-loving Lord through devotion. Seva doesn't simply mean to serve. Seva means to serve with no egoism and no selfishness. Real seva means we are not considering what we get in return. Seva is service with the intent to please the object of our service. It is cultivating that attitude that brings about real bhakti, real love. So in this sense, there is no big service and small service by external considerations. Big and small are seen by Krishna only in reference to the content of our sincerity and the purity of our love. One can build a magnificent temple with pure love, and that is a great service. Or one can offer a simple flower, and that is just as good, maybe even better, depending on the internal quality of how we are genuinely trying to please the Lord. And Lord Chaitanya came in the role of a devotee. His biographers, from the very beginning of Sri Chaitanya Bhagava, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sri Chaitanya Mangal, Sri Chaitanya Charita, Sri Chaitanya Chandrodaya, all of these great literatures, they establish, according to scripture, according to revelation, who Lord Chaitanya's true identity is. He's the source of the all-pervading Brahman. He's the source of the Paramatma. He's the source of all incarnations. He's Krishna tasting the sweetness of Radha's love and offering, offering that love to the world. But he takes the role of a devotee. Because at the end of Dwapa Yuga, Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. In the 18th chapter, his conclusion is 
सर्वधर्मान् परित्यज्या माम् एकम् शरणं ब्रजा अहम् त्वम् सर्वपापी पियो मोक्षा यी समिमा सचा Abandon all varieties of dharma and just go to the essence. Surrender to me with love. I shall deliver you from all reactions to all karmas. Do not fear. And Krishna tells in a simple verse how to surrender. Man manabhava mad bhakto madhya jimnam namaskuru mami vaishasi satyam te prati jani priyoshi me. Always think of me. Become my devotee, worship me, offer your homage unto me, and this way you will come to me without fail. But it is the nature of human inclination that we rarely learn by hearing. In order to really understand, there must be examples who personify how to do it. So Krishna himself incarnates in this age of Kali to teach us how to be a devotee by taking the role of a devotee. Lord Chaitanya was washing the clothes of his devotees. He was carrying the loads of his devotees. He was bringing kusha grass, tilak. Anybody could do that. To do these kinds of things, you can pay a person the very minimal wage and less in India even today to wash your clothes or carry your things or bring you a mat. But Lord Chaitanya considered this the treasure of his life, the opportunity to serve. Why? Why was he doing this? And why out of the millions of things that he did, his empowered biographers focus on these incidents. Because they are so important for us. We should never take any opportunity to serve Krishna or Krishna's devotee to be something ordinary, to something cheap. It's not something If we were paid tens and billions of rupees, that's not the value of having the opportunity to carry a grass mat for a devotee. It's precious. One of the reasons our spiritual progress is impeded is because we don't really appreciate the value of the opportunity to serve. The human ego wants to be served. The human ego wants to be glorified. And to the degree we hold on to these attachments, we can't really appreciate the supreme, eternal, infinite value of glorifying Krishna, glorifying those who love Krishna and serving them. They would say, no, no, you are you are the greatest Brahmin, you are the greatest scholar, now you've become the greatest devotee, I could wash my own clothes. But Nimai said, no, this is the only way that Krishna will be pleased with me, let me do. He was insisting. 
And in this spirit, he taught the devotees how to love one another. Anybody can talk about love. In every culture, there's all this talk about love. I'm from the 1960s in America, where we were called the peace and love generation. But what was the love? The Srimad Bhagavatam talks, Sabai pung sang puro dharmo yatopak dirad hoksha jay ahoitaki aprati hata yayatma suprasediti. The real love that satisfies the heart is the love of selfless service to the object of our love. And such love has to be without any egoistic motivations and not subjected to be interrupted by the inevitable impediments that will come before us. A mother who loves her child in this world, there's many impediments. Sometimes the child cries all night. And we heard last night, one little baby this big in the back of the tent cried. And we all had to stop because that little baby drowned out the microphone and the sound system. And that's in a tent like this, and 4,000, 5,000 people absorbing the sound. What to speak of when that baby is this far away from you in a little bedroom? How do you sleep? The mother will stay up all night, even if it's every night, to care for the child. What to speak of our devotion, our love for Krishna? Impediments, Lord Chaitanya told, are the friends of a devotee. Because the impediments that come on our spiritual path actually impel us, if we're sincere, to take shelter, to become very serious. In this spirit, the devotees joyfully came together and Lord Chaitanya inspired them all to, to chant the holy names of the Lord. Especially when they would chant in the courtyard of the house of Srivas. <clears throat> it was at that time Lord Chaitanya began to reveal himself to his devotees. To Adwaita Charya. Adwaita Prabhu was offering puja to his deities here in Navadweep. And Gadadhar was with him. And Nimai happened to come. And when Nimai saw Adwaita's incredible devotion for Krishna, he was so pleased, so overwhelmed that Adwaita had such a good fortune of such love for Krishna that Nimai actually fell unconscious in ecstasy. And taking the opportunity, Sri Adwaita Charya, he bathed the feet of the Lord with his tears. Then he offered Jandan, sandalwood, tulsi leaves. And then he offered a full arti and started with folded palms offering prayers. Now Lord Chaitanya was about one third his age. And Advaita was the leader of the entire Brahmin community. 
Gadadhar Pandit was really surprised. He said, why are you treating this young boy like this? And Advaita Chaya looked at him and said, Gadadhar, you are such a child. How long will you think that Vishwambar is just a young boy? He is our worshipable Lord. A few days later, Nimai was walking and he heard the Das Avatars, or the thousand names of Vishnu being um, sung, and he heard the name Varaha. And he ran to the house of Marari Gupta and manifested his Varaha Rupa to Marari. Today's Gopastami, the day when Krishna first was given charge of the cows in Sri Vrindavan Dham. One day Nimai was walking along the Ganga and he happened to see some beautiful cows and calves and bulls. They were chewing on grass. They were pushing each other with their nose. They were kind of playfully fighting with each other. Some of them were leaping in the air and jumping around and raising their tails. And when he saw these cows, he became so happy. He manifested his mood of Gopal and ran to the house of Srivas and revealed his divine opulence. when they were performing this kirtan in Srivas Angam, <coughs> Sachimata would come. And she would see her little, her Nimai, torrents of tears sometimes pouring from his eyes, sometimes in his ecstasy, his body would become as stiff as a stone pillar. Nobody could move it. And at other times, it would become as soft, as fresh butter. It seemed like he didn't even have any bones. These were the kinds of transformations of the ecstasy of his love. And sometimes he would leap into the air and then he would go into a trance and fall down to the ground. And when Sachimata would see this, her heart would break. A mother's love. And she prayed. From her heart of hearts, she prayed to Krishna. She offered two prayers. The first prayer was, Krishna, if I've ever in this life or any previous lives ever done anything to please you, then I will exchange all the credits of all my devotional and pious activities for one blessing, that when my child falls to the ground, that he does not feel any pain. And then she'd see him jump up again and fall down and she'd offer a different prayer. She said, maybe my child, because he's in such a trance, he doesn't feel pain, but I feel pain. So please give me the blessing that when my child falls down on the ground like this, that I don't see it. And Lord Chaitanya in his heart, in his own heart, understood her prayer and granted her. So that whenever that happened, she was in such a trance of ecstasy that she didn't even notice. <laughs> One day, Lord Chaitanya told his devotees, we are spending our whole day speaking about Krishna serving Krishna, chanting in kirtan, but we are wasting the entire night sleeping and doing other such things. 
from this day on, for the next one year, we should continue the kirtan throughout the entire night. That's quite an instruction. But the devotees had such faith in his will, they cried out, Haribo. And then Lord Chaitanya, according to Chaitanya Charitamrita, taught them how they could actually accomplish it. Singing all day and all night. He gave them this verse. Trinarapi sunichena todor iba sehishnuna amani namane dena kirtaniya sadahari If one is humble like a blade of grass, tolerant, forgiving, forbearing like a tree, eager to offer respect to others without demanding or expecting respect for oneself, then one could chant the names of the Lord constantly. Sometimes the Lord would give the analogy. Look at the grass. We are sitting on it, we are walking on it, and the grass just keeps coming back up to serve. Not trying to take a high position happy at everyone's feet. And look at the tree. In the summer, stands in the direct sunlight to give us shade. In the winter, stands covered with ice to give us wood to keep us warm. In the hot summer season, when there's a drought, the tree will have no water, but will give us delicious fruits to quench our thirst. And even if you cut down the tree, the tree will give its body for us to make a house for ourselves. The example of the tree is service to others. And the devotees took this to heart. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami said, we should take this verse, Trinata Pisuni Chena, and like a jewel, this jewel of a verse, we should put it on the string of the holy names of the Lord and keep it over our heart always. Lord Chaitanya, because these particular kirtans in Srivasa's house that were all night were so intimate and so deep, only the purest devotees were given entrance. Because others simply wouldn't understand the level that they were communicating on. Communicating with God. And Lord Chaitanya would chant and dance with all the rest of them, just like he was one of the devotees. But everyone there knew that he was their worshipable Lord. And as they danced and chanted in great happiness, it was their yearning to love him and serve him according to their natural eternal relationship with him. And one day, Lord Chaitanya came into the house of Srivas and he manifested what he called the Mahaprakash. Outside Srivas's house, there were so many people who wanted to get in. And many were very envious, very proud.
And they were insulted that they couldn't go in. And they started spreading the nastiest possible rumors all over Navadweep. We know why they do not allow us in that house. There are so many great scholars, Bhattacharyas, Mishras, Chakravartis, here in Navadweep giving good reputation, but this Srivas and his associates, they are criminals. They are low-class thugs. During the day, they chant tantric mantras to seduce five kinds of young girls. And they get those girls to come to the house at night. They lock the doors. Then they all drink all sorts of wines and liquors together. They decorate themselves with luxurious garments. They sing all sorts of um, passionate songs together. And in this way, they engage in the most abominable activities. That is what they are doing all night, every night. And that's why they don't let us in. Because they know that we are moral, ethical, saintly, enlightened people who will not stand for this in Navadweep. What is this loud chanting? They are hypocrites. They are saying God is within the heart as the Paramatma, the super soul. If God is in their heart, why do they have to scream so loud for him to hear? Like us. <laughs> A silent prayer will be heard. And if God, if you scream at somebody, it annoys them, it doesn't please them. So why are they screaming at Vishnu, screaming at Krishna? It's an insult. It's an offense. Because of their offense, there will be famine. There will be drought. There will be all sorts of tragedies here in Navadweep. We must stop them now. We should go to the king and report them and have them arrested, put in shackles, and thrown into prison. Another person says, we don't have time for that. Right now, tonight, we should pick up Srivas's house and break it to pieces and throw it in the Ganges and then shackle him and arrest him and beat him. Every night, they were outside the house talking like this. One person, a pious, nice person, said those to... All those devotees are so fortunate. They're chanting and dancing with Goranga. The only reason I'm not allowed in is I don't have the pious activities to earn such a blessing. And when the antagonists heard that, they were outraged. They'd scream, he's one of them! Beat him, get him! And the person would have to run away. If you didn't go along with their criticisms, with their propaganda, and with their blasphemous, you were singled out and persecuted. So common people were very, very, because these men were very powerful. They didn't know what to do. But the devotees couldn't hear any of it because they were so totally absorbed in the joy of chanting the holy name. Yeah. On this particular day when the Lord entered into Srivasa's courtyard, he sat on the throne of Vishnu. In the past, he would sometimes, in the role of a devotee, take a few moments just to timidly sit on it, just to give a little happiness to the devotees. But on this day, he sat very firmly with conviction. And he sat for 21 continuous hours 
revealing his various incarnations according to his devotee's love for him. They began to sing the song for the Abhishek. The Purusha shook the prayers. And with thousands and thousands of, of buckets, pots of water from the Ganga, they were pouring it over Lord Chaitanya's head as he was just accepting all the services that the devotees wanted and yearned to offer him. Nityananda, Adoita, Gadadhar, these devotees were there pouring the water over the Lord, Srivas, and others were carrying the water to them. And some of Srivas's maid servants and servants were helping to actually lug the water all the way from the Ganga to his house. Among them, there was one girl. Her name was Duki. Duki literally means one who is miserable. In Bengal at the time, if a mother would lose many children, either at birth or at a young age, they were so unhappy. If they finally got a nice child born, they would name the child Duki, which means she's miserable. This, the idea, the sentiment of that was that then Yamaraj, the superintendent of death, would feel sorry for her. Her name is Misery, so let me just let her be. <laughs> Otherwise, how many, why would you name your child the miserable one? <laughs> but that was her name. With such love, she was looking at Lord Goranga. And she was way, way in the background, unseen by anyone, just taking the water from the Ganga and putting it in completely nice, straight rows. So that the devotees who were bringing it to the other devotees who were bathing the Lord, it would be very easy for them. Such a simple service. Just carrying some pots of water and putting them in nice rows. But she was doing it with such deep affection, such honor and respect for all the devotees who love the Lord, and such devotion to the Lord. Nobody noticed her. Everyone was looking at the Abhishek. How many of you would be looking at Dukey when Goranga's having the Abhishek, the first time ever in history he was allowing this to happen. The Lord Goranga was looking at Dukey. There were Swamis there, there were Acharyas there, there were Paramhamsas there, and he was looking at little Dukey. And he asked Srivas, who is this girl? And Srivas said, she's a simple ser maid servant. Her name is Duki. Sri Gaur Sundar, he said, the name Duki does not feel right in my heart. On this day, I give her the name Suki, which means the happy one. With the name, he gave her unlimited eternal happiness. He gave her the ultimate perfection of life, prema bhakti. According to the Vedas, there are four goals of religion that most people follow, artha, dhamma, kama, moksha religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. 
the Purushartha Siromani, the crest jewel of all goals, is Prema Pumartha Mahan, the awakening of the eternal ecstatic love of Krishna that was within the heart of every living being. He gave Sukhi that blessing. What yogis spend lifetimes of severe austerities perfecting their breath control, their meditation, their physical postures, what jnanis spend lifetimes to achieve by scrutinizingly evaluating, analyzing all the sutras and the slokas of the various scriptures and discriminating between matter and spirit, Duki Suki, she attained that same goal just by her simple, pure-hearted desire to please the Lord by carrying some pots of water. This is how the Mahaprakash Leela begins. Then the devotees wanted to feed the Lord. Their desire was unlimited to feed him, so his yeyatamam prapadyante, Krishna reciprocates according to our desire. Now sometimes you get a guest in your house and you want to feed them a lot, but how much can they eat? You see, we, can, we have a certain capacity of how much we could actually reciprocate. But Lord Chaitanya said, bring me whatever pleases your heart. They would bring him. They brought him a dozen bananas. Within a fraction of a moment, he ate them. It's not like, <laughs> how does he do it? He did it really gracefully. He wasn't like the universal form, just devouring everything. He was very graciously, gracefully, but he could do it in a moment. He's inconceivable Shakti. They brought him, they were so enthusiastic to give him more and more, the devotees were going out, running out into the village and sending other people out to the village to get everything they could find. They were feeding him thousands and thousands of bundles of bananas. Yes. Thousands and thousands of pots of ganga water. Thousands and thousands of pieces of sand dash. <coughs> thousands and thousands of buckets of butter and dahi and milk. Thousands of coconuts. Thousands of betel nuts. And with a moment, he kept saying, bring more, bring more. <laughs> Not just because you can't do it. And I, I definitely can't do anything like that. It doesn't mean nobody could do it. If God, if the absolute truth has to be compared to us, what's the use of being God? He's Sarveshwareshwara. To me Sarveshwareshwara Prajendra Kumara. He's the controller of the controller of all controllers. He's creating and he's controlling the movements of the sun and the various planets and the universes. And we can't even control our own bowels. Yes? When nature calls, <laughs> doesn't matter whether, what race we're from, what sex we are, what kind of degrees we have in college. <laughs> when nature calls, we are under control. But 
the Lord. And while he was taking all that stuff, it doesn't say this in the scripture, 21 hours, nature had never called. <laughs> What did he eat and what did he drink? Literally tens and thousands of p pots of ganga water. He was smiling. He didn't grow in size. What was happening? It's not that the Lord was hungry for water and sandesh and bananas and coconuts and everything else. He was hungry for the love of his devotee. And the Supreme Lord can accept unlimited quantities of love. And the Supreme Lord gives unlimited quantities of love. They, they bathed him, they dressed him nicely, they put beautiful garlands on him, they fed him. And a beautiful kirtan was taking place. Then Lord Chaitanya blessed each of his devotees who were present by revealing to them the intimate most form that they worshipped of Krishna and offering them any boon that they liked. And he's even telling them about their past lives. He turned to Srivas just to charm his heart. He said, Srivas, do you remember do you remember years and years ago you were at the school of Devananda Pandit and he was reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam and as you were hearing the verses you were so moved with love for Krishna that you started to cry and uncontrollably you called out and the students considered you to be a disturbance to them. Now, actually, most people who do that in a class are a disturbance because they're not like Srivas. <laughs> they're not really in a spiritual trance of ecstasy of love. And they thought him to be like anybody else. So they, the students just picked him up, took him outside, and dropped him on the ground, a distant place, and then went back. And when Srivas came out of his trance, he found himself just laying there. And he felt very, very sad. Don't you remember this, Srivas? And then, because you felt so sad, you went home and you started to read Srimad Bhagavatam to somehow or other transcend that sadness. And as you were reading Srimad Bhagavatam, such a deep ananda of love awakened in your heart. It was uncontrollable. And since that day, every time you pick up the Bhagavatam to read it, tears flow from your eyes in the trance of the ecstasy of love for Krishna, total absorption in Krishna. He said, I am the one who gave you that feeling. I could not tolerate seeing your sorrow. When Srivas heard that, I said, Kankaras, do you remember many years ago when the king was sending dacoits, murderous people, to persecute the people of Navadweep, and they were chasing after you and your family, and you ran away? And you ran and ran and ran and you ultimately came to the bank of the Ganga. By the time you got there, it was the middle of the night. And these rapists and murderers were fast approaching. And there was no boat. And the Ganga was very wide and flowing very strong. And you were crying. You decided that rather than allow these people to touch your wife, your daughters, your family the way they would, 
that you would drown yourselves in the Ganga. At that moment, a boatman out of nowhere came out of the darkness. And you said, boatman, please, please save me. Save my family. I'll give you anything you want. And I brought, and that boatman brought you to the other side. Ganga Das, you never told anyone that story, but I know because I descended from the spiritual world to become that boatman just to save you. Ganga Das thrilled, overflowing with gratitude. The Lord said, Bring Sridhar. The devotee said, Who is Sridhar? Lord Gorasunda replied, He's my loving devotee. Nobody even knows who he is. He's a simple banana, banana leaf seller. Because he was so insignificant and so poor from the social perspective, whoever saw him just called him Kolavecha. Kolavecha means banana seller. They didn't even care to know his name. He said, but this Kolavecha Sridhar, he is such a dear devotee that for 12 hours continuously, every night, he's crying out the names of Krishna. You just go toward Simantadweep, toward the edge of Navadweep town, and you will hear his voice. Just follow that sound and you will find him. The devotees went running. And sure enough, they heard from a faint distance this very humble, humble cry of the holy names. They went to Sridhar. They said, Sridhar, Lord Goranga is calling you. Now by this time, Sridhar knew that Lord Goranga was his beloved Lord. He fell to the ground. Why is he calling me? They said, just come, just come. They had to actually lift him up and practically carry him back. He felt so unqualified. And he was standing right before Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya said, Kolavecha Sridhar, you have given me such nice bananas for so many years. And I would not eat a single meal if it was not off a brand new banana leaf plate that you would give me. Now, I want to reveal myself to you. Look. Sridhar looked up. He saw that Sri Chaitanya's form became that of Krishna. He was standing with the complexion of a tamal tree. The same Shamsundar that was the eternal object of Sridhar's love and devotion. He had beautiful lotus like eyes, curling black hair around his loving face. His lips were red like the banduli fruit. He had the Kostubamani on his chest. That gaze of love stared at Sridhar. On his side was Lord Balaram with the complexion of a spring cloud. He saw the forests of Brindavan, the tamal trees, the kadamba trees, 
the banyan trees. He saw Brahma, Shiva, Lakshmi, Narada, Sukadev, the four Kumaras, all with their hands folded, offering beautiful prayers to Krishna and Balaram. He saw unlimited of sarabi cows filling the entire background. Kaldavecha Sridhar, upon seeing this beautiful darsha, the ultimate object of his meditation, he fainted in divine ecstasy. And Lord Chaitanya said, Sridhar, Sridhar, get up. Behold my beautiful form. Lord Chaitanya began to recount the wonderful pastimes he had with Sridhar when he was a young boy for everyone to hear. Before he went to Gaya, when Nimai was performing his pastimes of a very restless student and then a very restless teacher, nobody knew that he was Krishna himself. But they loved him. Sridhar, he would sit on the side of a dusty road, selling whatever little he had. He grew some bananas. Sometimes he would somehow or other purchase some banana leaves or grow them. If he could, he would get some bananas or banana roots or banana bark. Whatever part of a banana tree, <laughs> he would try to make it into something to sell. He was so honest. He was compared to Maharaj Yudhisthira. He would never want to hurt anyone. This is the kind of businessman he was. He wanted to survive in his lifestyle in such a way that he would charge the least possible for whatever he sold. Have you ever met a businessman like that? And anybody who came to him knew he was so honest and so fair and such a, as we say in the West, rock bottom price Nobody would ever argue or bargain with him. What he said, they would just do. Except for Nimai. <laughs> Nimai would tell, oh, Sridhar, how much is this bananas? And he would give very, very fair price. Nimai said, why are you cheating me? I will give you half. <laughs> but how will I survive if you only give me half? Another thing about Sridhar is whatever money he made, the first half of it he would use to worship Mother Ganga. Because he understood that Mother Ganga is ultimately a person. She's a devotee of the Lord. She's an energy of the Lord that's descending to purify us through her blessings, through her grace. On a physical level, Mother Ganga is sustaining a whole civilization of people on her banks by providing water and filling wells. But beyond that, she's not an ordinary river. The breeze that touches the Ganga, the, wa the, the water of the Ganga, for one who bathes in it, touches it, tastes it, sees it, one gets purified. And if we're truly receptive, Ganga Mai awakens that love for Krishna within our heart. This was his love for Krishna. Nimai said, I will give you half. They would argue about the price. And in the end, Nimai would usually say, then I will just take it for nothing. 
And Sridhar would be so charmed by this beautiful young boy, he would say, my, he would say, Nimai, whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy. They had such a loving relationship that Nimai would come minimum two hours every day they would argue about the price of a banana. <laughs> Not because of the banana, because they couldn't give up each other's association. That was the medium. You see, this world and the material, apparently material things in this world can be an incredible spiritual medium between devotees if Krishna is in the center. And in this case, they didn't, Sridhar didn't even know Krishna was in the center, but he felt it. One day, Nimai said, Sridhar, you're so poor. You worship Krishna. You chant his name all night. I've heard. He would chant Hari Hari all night long, the Maha Mantra, and the materialistic people living around him could not tolerate it. They hated him. They would say so many nasty propagandic rumors against Sridhar. They said he's just a total useless failure. Look at the type of clothes he wears. Look at the type of house he lives in. And now he's trying to make himself out to be some big saint chanting all night. He's not a devotee. This chanting is not out of love. He's just being tortured by hunger because he can't make an, a living. And he's crying out because of the hunger pains. And sometimes they just pick up a vegetable and throw it at him and say, here, street art eat and shut up. Sridhar would just smile and chant Krishna's name. <laughs> Nimai would say to him, what is Krishna doing for you? Look at your clothes. There's so many holes in your clothes and you can't even afford needle and thread. You take the two different sides of the holes and tie knots to close them. And I see at least two dozen knots in your clothing. And look at your house. It's just a straw-thatched hut. And I'm sure the roof leaks in the monsoon season. And I don't see a single piece of furniture in your house. All you have is this one old, beat-up iron pot that you use for all your purposes. And look at your body. It's practically emaciated, thin. You're hardly eating. Around you, there's people, they're not devotees of Krishna. They have nice houses. They're nice and strong. They have good clothes. What is Krishna doing for you? Sridhar smiled. He said, Nimai, in my years in this world, I have come to learn through my observation that there's a king. The king has fine clothes, beautiful palace, and eats the most royal foods. And then there's a bird. The bird wears the same old feathers every day. He lives in a little nest of straw, and he just eats whatever little berries are in the trees. He said, but I don't see any difference between the two. Time is passing the same way for the bird and the king. They're both struggling. They're both enjoying. And time is passing the same way. So I may not have much, but I'm happy with what I have because I have Krishna. And 
Nimai said, you are a cheater, a hypocrite. <laughs> he said, you have great wealth, but you are hiding it. And Sridhar said, whatever you see is what I am. I, seeing is believing. I don't have anything. <laughs> he said, no, you are hiding a great treasure, and in this way you are cheating the people. But someday I will expose your great fortune. Sridhar didn't know what to say. Lord Chaitanya said, so how much are you going to, how many bananas will you give me for how much? Again, he gave a fair price. He said, do you not know? You worship Mother Ganga? Yes. You offer her so many offerings? Yes. I am the father of Mother Ganga. She is holy and she was sacred because she has washed my holy feet. Sri you know, would block his ears and said, you are so restless, you are so restless. Are you not afraid of even saying like this for the Ganga? And the Lord would take his bananas. He would say, oh, you take, you take. Sridhar, every day, his heart was Beating in ecstasy with the anticipation that Nimai would come to steal his bananas. He waited. He looked down that dusty pathway, just waiting for that beautiful golden form of Goranga to come. And if Goranga was late, Nimai was in such separation. He didn't know he was Krishna, but he loved him just like he loved Krishna. In fact, he loved him even more than he loved Krishna without knowing he was Krishna. And every day, Nimai would supply Goranga with a banana leaf. And it was the tradition in Sachimata's house, Nimai's mother, Nimai would not eat a meal unless it was on a banana leaf provided by Kolavecha Sridhar. And every now and then, on the straw roof of Sridhar's hut, a squash would grow, wild squash. And Kolavecha Sridhar always offered that to Nimai. This was their relationship. And on this day, Nimai never did anything but take, 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 and take from Sridhar. And all Sridhar ever did is give, give, and give. And on today's Mahaprakash, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was revealing his form of Krishna Balaram. And he told Sridhar, offer prayers to me. Sridhar said, my Lord, you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. How could I offer prayers to you? I'm not educated. I'm an ignorant person. I don't know how to make prayers. Nimai said, any words that come from your mouth will be a prayer. Just say something. And then the Lord commanded Goddess Saraswati to come onto the tongue of Sridhar so that whatever feelings was in his heart, he could eloquently express through words. And he did. All glories, all glories to you, the son of Jagannath Misha, the son of Sachi Devi. O oh Lord Vishrambar, you have descended from Goloka Vrindavan, the highest planet, simply to shower the whole of Navadweep and the whole world with bhakti. 
And not only do you give that bhakti, but you are conquered by that bhakti. And after you're conquered by that bhakti, you take that bhakti within the very core of your own heart and then you give it to others. This is the highest truth, O Lord. How you are the controller of all controllers, but you agree to be controlled by the love of your devotee. On the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Bhishma, Bhishma promised Duryodhana that I will make Krishna break his promise today. What was Krishna's promise? Before the battle began, he told Arjuna and Duryodhana, on one side I will give my army, on the other side I will be there. But I will not fight and I will not lift a weapon. That is my promise. So Duryodhana was thinking, if you're not going to fight and you're not going to lift a weapon, I'll take your army. And Arjuna was very happy. My Lord, I only want you. That was the difference in their faith. During the battle, Bhishma told Duryodhana that he was going to defeat the Pandavas. And he was fighting with Arjuna. And in the fight with Arjuna, Bhishma defeated him. Arjuna was laying, and he was helpless, and Bhishma was about to totally defeat him. At that moment, Krishna picked up the wheel of a chariot and charged at Bhishma. And Bhishma, in great happiness, offered his dandavats. That was his whole purpose. He didn't want to defeat, he did not want to defeat Arjuna. He wanted to make Krishna break his promise because he knew 100% for sure. Krishna told Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita before the battle, Konteya pratijani hime namedha bhakta pranashyati. Declare it boldly, Arjuna, my devotee will not perish. He would rather break his own promise than have his devotee break a promise. And Bhishma, when he was laying in his bed of arrows, he was remembering that with such ecstasy. Krishna was willing to be defeated by Bhishma. Why? Because of his pure devotion. And Yashodamai, in this month of Kartik, she tied Krishna with a rope and bound him. Therefore his name is forever glorified as Damodar. Restless little Gopal, the supreme master of all universes, the origin of all aspects of God, the Absolute. Yashoda Mai was not a warrior. She was not a mystic. She was a mother, a gopi. But Krishna, you allowed yourself to be bound by the rope of her love just to show the world for all time to come the power of bhakti. And Satyabhama, she was one of your wives in Dwarka, and you acted like a henpecked husband for her. She said, Krishna, you got a parijata flower for Rukmini, I want a parijata tree. What could you do? You went to Indra Loka and had to have a whole war with Indra to bring that Parijata tree to Satyabhama. Just to show the world 
that you are conquered by the love of your devotees. And you carry the gopas on your shoulders after they defeat you in wrestling. How is that? This little gopa named Sridhama. He's not a wrestler. He doesn't have muscles. He's just a little cowherd boy. With the same... You def Krishna defeated Chandra and Mustika. He had already defeated Putana and Trinavarta and Aga and Baka and Vatsa and Kaliya. He's defeated all of them. These are monstrous Rakshasha mystics. And here's little Sri Dhamma. Krishna, I want to wrestle you. Yes, I will wrestle you. And they're really, I give up, I give up, Krishna says. And then Sri Dhamma says, now you have to let me ride on your shoulders to let everyone in Brajbomi know that I defeated you in wrestling. And Krishna would gladly put him on the shoulders and dance and everybody would, all the gopas would be throwing flowers at Sri Dhamma because he won. But they were also throwing up flowers on Krishna because ultimately he won. Because for Krishna, that's winning. To be defeated by the love of his devotee is considered by Krishna to be the greatest victory. When a father wrestles with his little tiny child, Actually, the father could just pick up the child and go <laughs> <laughs> The child's unconscious in five seconds. <laughs> then he could go and say, you see, I defeated my child. Would the child be happy? Would he be happy? Would anybody be happy? When that same little child says, I want to wrestle with you, Father. Yes, yes, yes. And the child jumps up in the Father, and the Father says, I give up, I give up, I give up. And, and the child, then the Father carries the child on her shoulders and, say, and the child says, I beat up my Father. And my Father's so happy, and the child's so happy, and everybody's so happy. Like that. It's love. Krishna's conquered by the love of his devotees. Kalavetra Sridharma said, that the devotees, they beg for that bhakti. And if anyone sincerely begs for that pure bhakti, that person will defeat you. Because you become subordinate to the love of your devotee. And you have descended into Navadweep give that bhakti to everyone, to anyone who's willing to receive it. You've come to this world to flood people's hearts with this bhakti. Lord Chaitanya, he asked Sridhar to ask for any boon. He said, I will give you anything. Sridhar said, I don't want anything, my Lord. You are so poor. I will give you the riches of a king. I can give you kingdoms. I can give you planets. I can give you anything you like. Ask, ask. Sridhar said, what will I do with those things? I have no desire. I will give you the eight mystic perfections. Anima, Magima, Prapti, Lagima. All of these different cities by which you could perform incredible supernatural miracles. Sustain a life through mystic powers where you could live for millions of years. Sridhar said, the 
These mystic cities will just be a disturbance to me. I don't want them. Well, ask for something. Sridhar said, please, my lord, just be peaceful. I'm happy. I don't want anything. The Lord said, I am peaceful. <laughs> but I want to give you something. Ask, ask. He said, but I don't want anything. I'll give you liberation, moksha, mukti, what everybody's looking for. No more suffering, no more birth and death. He said, my Lord, I have no interest in moksha. Ask something. Then Lord Chaitanya said, to make me happy, ask for something. He said, if it pleases you, I will ask for one benediction. Let me forever be the servant of the servant of the servant of your servants. And let in every birth I have, and wherever I may be, in my heart, let me forever see this beautiful little boy, Nimai, coming to steal my bananas. This is the only blessing, my Lord. Just come to steal my bananas. And let me never forget you. Lord Chaitanya became so overwhelmed by his love, his devotion. The Lord was crying and all the devotees were falling on the ground in tears. And the Lord said, I give you that benediction. I give you the benediction of pure, unalloyed, ecstatic love for Krishna for the rest of eternity. When the devotees heard that, they loudly celebrated the good fortune of Sridhar by chanting Krishna's holy name. Vrindavan Das Thakur tells that anyone who with a sincere and faithful heart hears this narration of Kolavecha Sridhar will be given the supreme treasure of love for Krishna. What was Sridhar's qualification? He wasn't from a high caste, he wasn't learned, he wasn't rich. By material standards, he was quite a failure. He was totally unknown. Why the Lord gave such prominence in his pastimes to Kolavecha, this little banana leaf seller? There were great wealthy people who were devotees of the same caliber as Sridhar. Maharaj Prataparudra, Budimanta Khan. At one time, Ramananda Roy was a very wealthy governor of the It's not that their wealth was a disqualification. But you see, there is no material qualification or disqualification for bhakti unless we understand the simple, innocent essence of the heart of Sridhar, whether we're rich or poor, brahmachari, grihastavana, prasanyasi, whatever we may be, we don't really understand what pleases Krishna. Sridhar wanted nothing for himself. He found unlimitedly more pleasure in pleasing Lord Krishna, Lord Goranga. When you water the root of the tree, every part of the tree is satisfied. Krishna is the root of all that exists. Janmadya Shayataha. And Sridhar wasn't the Brahmin who was doing all kinds of technically excellent, eloquent pujas either.
in his offerings to Lord Chaitanya, there was not mantra, tantra, yantra, muja, mudra, or puja. Lord Chaitanya would come and steal us, steal us bananas. Lord Chaitanya could not give up the company of Sridhar. He loved him so much because of the simplicity and purity of his devotion. Then Lord Chaitanya called for Marari Gupta. Has His Holiness Jaipatak Maharaj come yet? Somebody please tell me when he comes. Okay. He said, Marari, come. Marari looked forward and Lord Chaitanya, he said, look. Marari looked up on the Singhasan and where Lord Chaitanya was sitting, he saw the beloved Lord of his life, Ram, with the beautiful complexion of Durva grass. Lord Ram Chandra was with a golden bow and quivers. And once, when, when Marari Gupta saw his beloved Lord Ram, he fell unconscious and the Lord touched him and said, Marari, stand up, stand up. He said, don't you remember? Don't you remember that demon Ravana who so maliciously stole, stole your worshipable Sita, brought her to Sri Lanka? You jumped across the ocean just to give her my message? And then Ravana bound you with ropes and lit your tail on fire. And with that fire on your tail, you burned down his city. Don't you remember this? He said, look, on my one side is Lakshman. You lifted the Gandamad in a mountain to save his life out of love for him. And on my other side is Sita your beloved worshipable goddess, seeing the torment that she was enduring in the Ashokvan of Ravana, you shed a shoreless ocean of tears. Don't you see now? You don't remember, but I am reminding you. I am Ram, and you are my eternal servant, Hanuman! <laughs> Marari Gupta, there he saw before him Ram, Sita, Lakshman, and he saw thousands and thousands of monkey soldiers offering prayers around Ram and Sita and Lakshman, and then he looked down and noticed that he had a tail. He looked at his body. He was a monkey. He was Hanuman. The Lord said, Marari Gupta, ask for any boon. You are my beloved, loving devotee. Marari, in the mood of Hanuman, the eternal Das, servant of the Lord. He said, I do not want to ask anything from you, but if you want to give me something for the rest of eternity, give me the blessing that I will always sing your names and glories that in any situation that may ever come, my Lord, that I never forget you. And that birth after birth after birth, give me the blessing of living in the company of your devotees. Those devotees who consider you their master and themselves, 
your humble, loving servant. My only aspiration, Lord, is to be the servant of the servant of your servants and always to chant your holy names. Anyone who hears this devotion with a sincere and faithful heart will be given pure love and devotion to Lord Gauranga. Then Lord Chaitanya, like as if he had many, many mouths, he glorified his devotee Murari Gupta. Murari is the name of Krishna or Ram. He said to Murari, and to all the devotees of Rao, you appear to be a simple family man. Murari had a wife, he had a house, he was a doctor, he had a profession. And unfortunately people just because, devotees never want attention, they never want glorification. Sometimes it may come, sometimes it may not come. It really doesn't matter. All that matters is, are we trying to please Guru and Krishna? You seem to be living in this world like just like any other ordinary man. But Marari is hiding in your heart. Gupta means a secret hiding place. Therefore, because Marari is always hiding in your heart, your name is Marari Gupta. Then the Lord turned to Haridas Thakur and said, Haridas, come and look at me. And Haridas looked and what he saw we will discuss tomorrow. <laughs>